Hello, everyone. I'm Deb Sahadi, your teaching director, and welcome to this week's lecture. Let's open in a word of prayer. Oh, dear Father God in heaven, we are so thankful that you preserved these lessons for us in your word and how we can just learn so much from these ancient kings and kingdoms and to know that you are sovereign, you are holy, and you are in control. So, Father God, we always ask that you would open our hearts, our ears, our eyes, so that we will learn what you will teach us from these events that you have preserved. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, we know that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on earth, towering over 29,000 feet close to the cruising altitude of jets. It's on the crest of the great Himalayas of southern Asia on the border between Nepal and China. Its sheer size beckons a challenge to a certain type of people. Who can climb me? Edmund Hillary was the first to reach the summit, and over 60,000 people have successfully reached the top since his feat in 1953, while over 300 have died trying. Climbers train for years, preparing to endure extreme physical challenges, cold temperatures, high altitudes, and difficult terrain. What is in the challenge that makes it irresistible to some people? Why, why do people do it? Psychologists say thrill seekers need fear and an extreme adrenaline rush to satisfy the reward for behavior. Glenn Sparks, PhD of Purdue University, explains that, quote, thrill seekers take part in such dangerous journeys because of the gratification they feel from mastering something that is so frightening. Why take the risks? The risks are actually an essential part of it, Sparks said. Without any perceived risk, there can't be a feeling that any significant challenge has been conquered. As for sensation seekers, no risk no adrenaline, end quote. Well, I ask you, I mean, what's the fundamental human characteristic at work here? Yes, pride. The challenge has to be conquered. There needs to be a reward for behavior. The need for gratification outweighs personal safety. These needs are driven by pride. Pride and self-sufficiency, self-accomplishment and, and self-absorption. It's this pride in all of us, albeit to differing extremes, that drives this risky behavior, which is actually defiance, as many thrill-seeking stunts are labeled death-defying. In our reading this week, we find Belshazzar in complete defiance, but his defiance was beyond thrill-seeking. What it was, was, was bold and brazen defiance because it was against God the Almighty. It was an arrogant mockery, really. It was totally unbridled, unabashed, and, and quite shameless. Perhaps Belshazzar thought his drunken display of disrespect for the Lord God was death defying. Perhaps he sought to scale the heights of insolence and his need for gratification and reward for behavior as he self-congratulated his arrogant superiority among his guests. But in the end, he didn't defy death at all, and he got just reward for his behavior. So please follow along in your Bibles as we peer in on Daniel chapter 5. Our outline today follows the text, beginning with the travesty. The bold, brazen, unbridled, unabashed, unashamed travesty, mocking God in open, flagrant display. God would not let this behavior go unchecked, and we find his handwriting proclaiming the judgment against Belshazzar. Unable to read, much less understand the message, the king called for Daniel, who was able, by God's power, able to both read and give the interpretation. What he has to say is indeed very troubling. As swift as the handwriting appeared, God's judgment was fulfilled that very night. And what we find here is one example of how God always has the last word 
He is sovereign. His precept stands. He is the final authority. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And that's from Isaiah 48 and 1 Peter 125. God's word does stand forever. His plans will not be thwarted and God will not be mocked. It's in this context that our opening scene squats right in the center of God's providence, sovereignty, and holiness, which was at last recognized by Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom prior to this event. How things change. King Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 BC. Historians trace the rule of King Belshazzar, ruler of the city of Babylon, to being co-regent with his father Nabonidus, who was married to Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, making Belshazzar Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. While King Nabodius was out battling Cyrus, his son Belshazzar held quite a feast with a thousand of his closest friends, the upper echelon of society, the lords. And quite a party it was, more like a drunken orgy, with Belshazzar's arrogant self-confidence in full display. I mean, who holds a party while the enemy is parked at your doorstep? And we don't have to go far to answer that question, do we? I mean, when things are good, when we're enjoying happiness and prosperity, when things are going our way, when we're distracted with comfort and success, that's when Satan is parked at our front doors, right? In the case of Belshazzar, the army of the Medes and Persians had encircled his city, which he thought was impervious to enemy invasion. The walls were wide and high enough, the river Euphrates ran through the city, so the water supply was ample, and they boasted a 20-year supply of food within the city walls. So party on! It, it, it's this self-confidence that bolstered his pride and overshadowed recent history. The recent history of his grandfather's dream about losing the kingdom. The recent history of God saving the three Jewish boys from the fiery furnace. The recent history of his grandfather going insane for seven years, then being restored even greater than before the incident, and then proclaiming God's sovereignty, saying, quote, I, Nebuchadnezzar, pray to and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble, end quote. Ignoring all of this, Belshazzar commanded that the sacred vessels from the Jerusalem temple, which Nebuchadnezzar had pillaged and destroyed, to be brought out. These were the gold and silver vessels that God himself gave written instructions to David on exactly how they were to be fashioned. Yes, God gave David written instructions. Listen to this from 1 Chronicles 28, beginning in verse 14. It says he, referring to God, he gave gold by weight for things of gold, for all articles used in every kind of service, also silver for all articles of silver by weight, for all articles used in every kind of service. And then we move on to verse 17, and it says, and pure gold for the forks, the basins, and the cups, for the golden bowls, and the weight of each, for the silver bowls, and the weight of each. And we move on finally to verse 19, and this is now David speaking. He says, all this he, God, all this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord, all the work to be done according to the plan, end quote. I don't know if Belshazzar knew that God had personally written the plans for all construction of the temple and its contents, but he did know that the vessels he ordered to be brought out from the treasury were from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And as such, he knew they would have been sacred to be used only in service to the Lord in a, in a very prescribed manner by consecrated individuals. But he was above it all. And you know, if t-shirts were fashionable in his day, he would have had this one. I am great from me 24-7. In his haughty self-promotion as he ascended the heights of his own greatness, he audaciously mocked God as they all drank wine from the sacred golden vessels, as, as if they were common drinking cups. To add insult to injury, 
They toasted, they worshiped the false Babylonian gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Such a shameful mockery, brazen idolatry and defiance of God in light of the command Nebuchadnezzar had given in verse uh, 329 that all people respect the God of the Jews, whom he called the King of Heaven in verse 437. The God of the Jews, the God of Heaven, the God of the universe, whose word stands forever, the living God who always has the last word. God's holy righteousness will tolerate insolent blasphemy and conceited defiance for only so long. Then his hand of judgment will move. God gave David the written pattern for the consecrated vessels. I think it was quite fitting then that God would give Belshazzar his judgment in writing. God always has the last word. God did not delay. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the wall, in plain view for everyone to see. It wasn't a vision or a dream, but an actual hand writing a tangible physical inscription opposite the lamps, lampstand so that full light was cast on the hand and the message. Can you imagine? How, what would you be thinking? We here and now today have a hard time comprehending unusual things. Take this image, for example, captured by NASA last September, which has baffled scientists because it's nebula energy. A pulsar wind nebula about 12 miles across that has organized itself to resemble a hand. That's not what energy does. That's not even a thing. Energy doesn't organize. Scientists have dubbed it the hand of God. God does work in mysterious ways, making his presence known through his creation. Imagine if you were there in the banquet hall. Imagine if you were Belshazzar doing what you were doing and a supernatural hand appeared and wrote on the wall. Would you be frightened? Well, of course. I mean, things like that don't happen naturally. Of course, the king was frightened. He experienced tremendous terror, dread, anxiety, horror, distress, fright, panic, alarm, fear in all its terrifying forms. The color drained from his face, his limbs were like jelly, and he shook so violently that his knees knocked. But what did the message say? Nobody there, not the king, not any of his thousand guests, not his wives, not his concubines, not his servants. Nobody could read the message. The king called for his so-called wise men, a generation from the same assembly that failed in knowing and interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And Belshazzar offered a great reward to anyone who could both read and interpret the message in verse 7, making it clear that the message could not be read. If it couldn't even be read, it certainly couldn't be interpreted. Enter the, quote, wise men who in verse 8 could not read the writing or make known the king the interpretation. And the Bible is clear. Nobody could read the writing. And Various theories exist about the language. Was it Aramaic or Hebrew or Chaldees, perhaps obscured by the position of the letters? But such speculation flies in the face of what God's word says in verse 7 and 8. I mean, the, the supernatural hand is acknowledged. Why reduce the writing to a common language? Further proof that the language was unknown is found in verses 15, 16, 25, and 26, and we'll get to them in the next segment. Suffice it to say, which is what the word says, nobody could read the message, which caused great fear and dread to come upon Belshazzar. Hearing the complete halt in the revelry and the king's distress that nobody could read the message, the queen entered the great hall. Now, historians figure the queen here is actually the queen mother, Belshazzar's mother, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, because we know she was not a wife, they were already present in the hall that we read in verses two and three. The queen knew Daniel, probably had I witnessed Daniel's wisdom, knowledge, understanding in interpreting dreams, explaining riddles and solving problems, who, as she put it, 
in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Of course, we know the Holy Spirit was upon Daniel. The queen recommended that the king summon Daniel to read the words and also interpret them. And notice she reminded Belshazzar of the esteem Nebuchadnezzar had for Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, who made Daniel chief over the wise men because of Daniel's excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding. And she's basically saying, here's a guy in your own kingdom who can solve this mystery. The queen had complete confidence in Daniel, who she referred to by his Hebrew name out of respect for Daniel and his God. It's quite evident that Belshazzar neither respected Daniel or his God. When Daniel was brought before the king, Belshazzar addressed him with sneering contempt from an arrogant stance of superiority. He says, you were that Daniel. Now, anytime someone inserts that before a person's name, they're insulting not only the person but his very name, which in those days carried great significance. And Daniel's name in Hebrew means God is my judge. Perhaps at this point, the king had an inkling he was about to be judged by an inferior God of the Jews. Belshazzar went on to remind Daniel of his lowly origin and, and, and continued, you're that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. You're that Daniel, a lowly exile. And I'm now reduced to asking you for help because none of my great faculty of wise men could read the writing nor could they interpret it? Of course they couldn't read it. These were pagan mystics, as far from God as you can get. And as John 15, 5 tells us, apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. In verse 16, the king promised great rewards, including becoming third ruler behind him and his father, Nebodius, in a purple robe with a gold necklace. If Daniel can read the writing, and make known the interpretation. Well, Daniel's services were not for sale. He, he was a prophet of God, serving God, not a vendor peddling his goods. And it's D Daniel's faithfulness to God that by rejecting these rewards also removed him as a primary political target of the invading enemy. And we see that remaining on God's path is the best place to be. And we find that Daniel didn't jump right into the reading and interpretation. Instead, he began by recalling recent history, reminding Belshazzar of God's providence and power and sovereignty and justice and grace to his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, who became so prideful, his spirit was hardened, and God brought him down from his kingly throne in a most humiliating and disgusting manner, until he knew the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will, in verse 21. And here is the contrast of the earthly power and pomp to the heavenly sovereignty and justice. It's in this context that Daniel goes on to inventory Belshazzar's sins. And, and the key difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar is that Belshazzar did not humble his heart in spite of knowing everything about Nebuchadnezzar's experience. And not only did he not repent and humble himself, he piled sin on top of sin and lifted himself above the Lord. You went so far to mock his holiness and drink wine from his holy vessels. And in further brazen contempt, you praised the false gods in open, shameful display of disrespect for God, whom you did not honor. The God who holds your very breath in his hand. Yes, the very hand of God who holds your life and rightfully and righteously now judges you, writing his judgment for all to see, written on the wall. So everyone would know God always has the last word indeed. Following this scathing but accurate review of Belshazzar's transgressions, Daniel proceeded to read and interpret the message, which was quite to the point, basically saying, you and your kingdom are now ending because you have been judged and fall so very short. 
and your kingdom will be removed from you and given to the Medes and Persians. That's it. And because God always has the last word, it would come to fruition. The warning was written. How many warnings are written in God's word? These warnings in God's word are plain and clear, translated in over 3,400 languages. Perhaps we need a warning notice on the cover. Or perhaps some people would prefer not going in the Bible at all and would wrap it in warning tape. Well, the existence of warnings might in and of itself frighten some people. Wouldn't you want to be warned if you were about to fall into a boiling hot lava pit? If you did fall in, wouldn't you wonder why someone didn't warn you? This right here, ladies, is why we are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, the Bible contains warnings, warnings about dreadful things. But it also provides the escape, God's plan of salvation for all who believe in his precious only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf, taking our punishment, so we don't have to fall into the eternal lake of fire. Tell someone. God immediately wrote his judgment, but notice it wasn't until later that night that Belshazzar was killed, giving him time to repent. God is gracious. Belshazzar had reached the summit of his defiance, and God's judgment was fulfilled just as he spoke through Daniel. That very night, Belshazzar was assassinated, and God gave the kingdom to Darius the Mede. Um, the Medes and Persians, by the way, were confederate at this point. The Babylonian kingdom ended, just as God's prophecy said it would. The highest mountain, the kingdom of Babylon, was conquered. And look at God's swift judgment fulfilled. That very night, Belshazzar was killed. The kingdom turned over. The suddenness of the judgment was as sudden as the hand appearing. And we can also almost imagine God's hand coming down from heaven to discharge the judgment. The king of heaven, as Nebuchadnezzar called him, the king of heaven with his scepter of justice. Psalm 45, 6 says this, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. The scepter, representing the absolute and eternal supremacy and authority of the Lord's holy justice, his utter sovereignty over his creation. The scepter will not depart from the Lord's hand, according to Genesis 49.10. And we will find the complete fulfillment, still in our future, in Revelation 19.15 when Christ Jesus returns and takes his rightful place over the kingdoms of this world. And, quote, he will rule them with an iron scepter, not only in justice, but in love and protection. And Jesus, the word that became flesh, is the last king this world will ever have because God always has the last word, the last and the everlasting the scepter of God, the hand of God, is a fearful thing to his enemies. But to those of us who are his children, because we have put our faith in his son, Jesus Christ, we find comfort. His rod and staff comfort us. We know justice will ultimately be served. God is at work in the lives of humans. He always has been and he always will be. And, and this lesson of repentance, or lack thereof, should teach us humility. It's a privilege to learn from these ancient events. And knowing God doesn't change when we understand God's ways of the past, the greater our accountability is in the present. And with privilege comes responsibility and the blessings overflow. And, you know, it's easy to judge Belshazzar and his thousand drunken friends. But if we consider the moral decline and lack of godly values in today's culture, I mean, right here and now in our own country, we easily see the same wicked pattern of ancient Babylon. 
And if we draw the parallel from a thousand people at a drunken orgy to a whole country filled with people given over to their own pleasures, doing what they think is right in their own eyes, we, we should be very concerned. But that concern should move us to action, action to share the gospel at every opportunity. Well, things on earth change and we seem to slide further into moral decay and civil strife and social sin. Psalm 119.89 gives us encouragement. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. The question is, will we choose to accept God's word, his written word, his everlasting living word, and the word that became flesh, Jesus Christ, God does have the last word, the word that became flesh. Jesus Christ will be the last king our world will ever have, the last and everlasting. Will we be ready? Please pray with me. Father God, we, again, thank you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have in studying your word. And we pray that we would have the faithfulness and readiness of Daniel to, to serve you without hesitation and to stand firm in your word in spite of any worldly barriers that might be put in our path. Father, we ask that you'd help us always stay on your path, shining your light boldly and in truth and love. We love you, Father. We thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.